Welcome. I'm Tiziana Deering, host of Radio Boston, and I'll be your moderator today. Thanks so much for joining us as we discuss new approaches to reducing gun violence. We have four stellar panelists with us today. David Hemingway, professor of health policy at the Harvard Chan School. Sonali Rajan, professor in the Department of Health Studies and Applied Educational Psychology at Columbia University. Joseph B. Richardson, Jr., Empower Professor of African American Studies, Medical Anthropology and Epidemiology, and co-director of the UMD Progress Initiative at the University of Maryland, and Gabriela Rodriguez, Executive Director of Q Latinx. Thanks to all four of you for being here today. 25 years. After the shooting at Columbine High School shocked the country and the world, the U.S. continues to experience outsized rates of gun violence. The question is, what has changed since then? In 1999, almost 29,000 people in the U.S. died from firearms. In 2021, the number was almost 49,000. And in 2020, firearms became the leading cause of death for children and teens. In fact, between 2011 and 2021, gun fatalities among children rose almost 90%. And the burden of violence is disproportionately borne by children of color. Black children are 11 times more likely than white children to die from firearm homicide. And some of these statistics will be in the live chat if you want to follow on them. But there's also progress. And today we'll have an opportunity to talk about promising new strategies that could reduce firearm deaths and injuries even in the absence of major new gun legislation. So to begin, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to draw a connection for us between your work and this 25 year arc since Columbine. David, I'll start with you. You've been studying the statistics on gun violence for decades, watching the impact of policy changes. In just about a minute, highlight what has changed since Columbine. Well, in, in most other high income countries, when there's a mass shooting, uh, there's an opportunity to strengthen gun laws. And a lot of these countries have taken that opportunity. Australia did, New Zealand did, for example, and their gun problems have dramatically reduced. Um, the United States went in the opposite direction. Uh, we now have much weaker laws. Uh, we have many more guns than we used to have. We have more, many more le uh, guns which are lethal, more lethal than they, went, they used to be. And not surprisingly, uh, with our gun laws, which have been weakened, uh, we have uh, lots more, much higher rates of firearm death than we used to have. Um, at the federal level, for example, our laws are much weaker than they used to be. Just one example is we got rid of our assault weapons ban during this period, which was uh, designed to help reduce mass shootings. Uh, at the state level, about half our states, the gun-friendly states, have made it much easier for anyone to get any kind of gun at any time and take it anywhere. About half the states now have permitless carry. There's no background check, no training required to, to carry a gun. They have stand your ground laws, which make it much easier to kill someone just because you're afraid. Uh, the evidence indicate that both these types of laws increase homicide. Um, the gun-friendly states have done much worse than the other states in terms of uh, violent death increases over the past 25 years. But all that's considered, there are these wonderful new initiatives, uh, which uh, we're going to present a sample of today. And so hopefully they will matter. Thanks, David. I'll turn to you next, Sonali. You study school violence prevention, the impact of gun violence on children. Uh, you know, Briefly, what have you observed in the years since Columbine? Thank you. Um, so, you know, I'm dating myself a little bit here, but I was in high school when Columbine happened. And I think many of us remember exactly as you were describing um, how deeply shocking that moment was. Um, I grew up nowhere near Colorado, you know, thousands of miles away, and it still just felt for all of us um, just like something so just completely uh, uh, horrific. And uh, genuinely shocking. And I think the part that is remained shocking for me now is that 25 years later, I have my own little one in school and uh, gun violence in schools persists and has gotten worse. And I am, we have, you know, hundreds of, of school shootings that happen every year. Uh, as you mentioned, gun violence is now the leading cause of death among all children and teens in the U.S. Uh, 
data from the Washington Post have shown that over 360,000 children have been exposed to gun violence specifically in K through 12 schools since the Columbine shootings. When we think about that number, that's an extraordinary uh, burden that we have placed on our children. And the school safety, our response to the anticipation of this kind of violence is now a billion, that's billion with a B, a billion dollar industry. And we have not done enough to stem the tide of, the, of these tragedies. Uh, per what David was saying, there are uh, there's some encouraging and promising new work and solutions, which I am so grateful for and look forward to sharing and being in conversation with you all today. Is that a billion dollars in new cost? Was billion dollars we just weren't spending then? Billion dollars, yeah. It's a it's an entire industry that emerged. Uh, bulletproof school products and you know um, lockdown drills and just all sorts of things. Ways in which we are currently uh, hardening our schools in response to the persistence of this kind of violence and the anticipation of this kind of violence in lieu of investments in actual preventive measures. So that is really what's happening right now. And it's uh, a billion dollar industry that has very little scientific evidence guiding its effectiveness. So that's something else we can, you know, we're concerned about. Thank you. So Joseph, I'll turn to you. And of course I started, uh, you know, these remarks with Columbine, but the reality is that high profile events like that that's a piece, but it's a sliver of the daily toll of gun violence. And you're examining violence intervention strategies in schools and in the broader community. So let's take that lens, right? More about what you've seen change in the last 25 years. Sure. So at the time of, of Columbine, there wasn't a significant investment in, in community violence intervention programs. And in fact, I would say that the hospital violence intervention program model, there were less than 10 hospital violence intervention programs in the country. Um, if you fast forward to 2011, uh, the movie produced by Steve James, The Interrupters, the, interu the violence interruption model was just becoming popularized at that time. And so since, um, since the Columbine, if you fast forward to where we are now, there's been over a $690 million investment in, in community violence intervention. And in fact, between 2017 and 2021, the investment went from 60 million to 690 million. Um, last week, I attended the uh, Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative um, conference in Chicago, and the Attorney General um, Gar uh, Merrick Garland was there and he presented that there would be a $78 million investment at, from the DOJ and CBI. And so we've seen significant investment um, and the proliferation of CBI programs across the country since Columbine. And we also now fortunately are moving CBI specifically violence interrupters into schools. And I and I appreciate that because it serves as an alternative to detention and as, as an alternative to the school to prison pipeline and less of a reliance on law enforcement within schools. And again, CVI standing for Community Violence Community Intervention. Violence intervention. So before I go to you, Gabriella, David, I'll come back to you and I'm going to ask you a question. I have no idea if you know the answer to this or not, but in hearing uh, Joseph talk about the $690 million investment and hearing Sonali talk about a billion dollars spending now, you know, sort of in comparison, the, the amount of money that's spent in a, I don't know, a year, a decade on, on lobbying in both directions on gun policy, do we have any idea what that order of magnitude is? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I I have no idea how much it is, but it's a lot. It's clearly, this is one area where there's a lot of passion and a lot of money being spent. Fair enough. And again, I had no idea if you know, right? I'm just, I'm seeing that I'm hearing those numbers and I'm guessing we're talking about large disparities in order of magnitude, but I did know I was catching you by surprise. Gabrielle, I'm going to turn to you. Um, you were part of the founding organizers of Q Latinx to advance and empower Central Florida's Latinx community. And this was specifically in the wake of the 2016 mass shooting at the Pulse nightclub. Um, what changes have you seen in how communities come together to heal and build community after tragedy in the, you know, the window of your work? 
Yeah, so I think we have to understand the the platform that we were working on in the beginning, right? I think after uh, 2016 and the Pulse tragedy, we saw an extraordinary amount of like unity and compassion that came in the aftermath. Um, but it came and then it just left. Um, you had a lot of people that were here, but they weren't from here, right? So it was really apparent and clear that we needed more than a, just a temporary fix. And we needed to really address the deep rooted systemic issues that really exposed the tragedy. Now, fast forwarding to eight years later, um, we've now been able to ask those questions. We've shown up at the table. Um, we've been able to get mentorship and lean in on other organizations doing work elsewhere um, to really ask those questions and bring those interventions back to, to our communities to see what works and what doesn't. When I think of these large numbers that are being invested back into community, sometimes it isn't really always attainable to, to those working it and that are impacted. So I, I look forward to the conversation moving forward to see how we can build better solutions. But I know one thing that we've been able to do is really think out of the box, right? Um, after the Pulse tragedy, what we saw a lot of, there were a lot of disparities when it came to language, when it came to addressing just culture in itself and understanding that, right, some of the healing practices and some of the decisions that were being made weren't for or by our community. So some of those strategies didn't necessarily work. So we've been able to reformat that and now really hone down on being able to ask for what we need, but it's really been a long road. So I want to shift now. I would, I'd like us to spend just a little bit of time on sort of changing narratives. We know that when you have a mass shooting like the one at Columbine, the media coverage really focuses heavily there. That tends to dominate. We also know that mass shootings represent a fraction of the deaths and injuries due to firearms. Um, I want to talk about other narratives that you'd like to see raised up, how you think this focus on mass shootings has influenced policy response to gun violence. So Joseph, I'll start with you. Um, I would say just in terms of how we reframe the narrative around around school shootings, definitely um, I think the gun violence reporting in terms of shootings needs to change regarding even race, right? And the ways we racially frame what school shootings look like. For, or on average, the majority, of, the majority of mass shootings that we see in this country focus primarily on dis, and disproportionately on communities of color. And so uh, focusing that narrative, but as well as the investment, again, in terms of, as I mentioned, the investment in CVI within schools as an alternative to law enforcement and moving more children who are black disproportionately black and brown into the juvenile justice and criminal justice system, moving them away from the, the pushing them into that school to prison pipeline by using credible messengers within schools that can divert them into a more of a public safety and public health approach. And I think if we make more of an investment in that, we'll see less of the, um, the increase of the number of black and brown children who are stigmatized by being placed with without warranted reason into the uh, criminal justice and juvenile justice systems. Gabriela, let's go to you next. Yeah, uh, so I think that mass shootings like Columbine, Sandy Hook, Pulse, they've all um, really raised the, the conversation and attention, but I think it's really overshadowed the day-to-day -day lives that, that we live, right? A lot of us work, play, and live in the same spaces uh, as our communities that we face on a daily gun violence, um, it was normalized in our communities. So then seeing it on on social media and then seeing it in, in the media has really shifted what that looks like. Um, I think it's crucial to be able to raise awareness on these everyday shootings that occur um, because it really impacts our community's health, especially like our, our friend Joseph said, uh, when it comes to communities of color, or other marginalized groups like our LGBTQ, a community. And I wanted to uplift as far as statistics are our black trans women of color. I think of in, in the beginning of uh, 2024, the first two weeks, we lost three of our trans siblings. Um, in 2023, there were 35 homicides of transgender or gender expansive people and 80% of those were with guns. Um, 
I think if we really want to adopt uh, and reduce gun violence, we need to adopt a holistic approach with not only being able to trust build in the communities that we're going into, but really talking outside of just gun violence prevention. How are we uh, infusing art and other mediums? Because historically, a lot of our communities haven't had the opportunity to talk about violence that's been against us. So I'm going to stay with you for just a second, Gabriela. You talked about how we've normalized this. What has been the biggest driver of you know, normalization and, and how do we stop that? Oh, I'd say the media, misinformation and disinformation. I think the power of narratives and the power of being able to share our own personal experience is one of the biggest drivers. Me being able to sit in a one-on-one -on -one with one of my counterparts or one of my community members to say, hey, it may not be the same journey, but we're in this together. And this is how I've been impacted has really shifted the conversations that I'm having with people. And then those stakeholders are then able to go out to community and share with other folks. David, I think I'll jump to you next on this. So in, in terms, I wanted to talk about suicide because I, that's what we really do a lot of work on. And interestingly, I think most, or a sizable percentage of mass shootings, the shooter is suicidal and often commits suicide. And suicide, most people don't always recognize is there's many more firearm suicides than there are firearm homicides. And this is where we have actually the best data and the best studies that have been done. Large numbers of studies have been done so that now that the evidence is overwhelming that a gun in the home increases the likelihood of a suicide in the home by something like not 50%, but threefold. And it's the, the risk is to everybody in the household, not just the gun owner, but the gun owner's spouse, the gun owner's children. Uh, only a tiny percentage of people attempt suicide with a gun but over well over half of all suicides are gun suicides. So if you look at who's dying, it's people living in gun-owning households. Uh, if you take 100 pills, um, medicine is so good now that there's a 98% chance or, that you can get saved. If you shoot yourself in the head, you're dead forever. Um, people don't really understand that bringing a gun into the home for protection and most of them, that's why there's guns in the home now, is that typically it increases substantially the risk that someone in the home will die a violent death. That doesn't mean that, oh, you'll clearly have a suicide, but it means that instead of having a you know, 1% chance that this family would have a suicide, now you have a 3% chance, which means a lot in terms of the number of people who are dying. And am I understanding, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but there, there's a lethality dimension that an yeah. attempt with a firearm is just substantially different than most other That's forms exactly of attempt. Right. But the case fatality rate, as they say, is like 90% with a firearm, and it's 2 to 3% with what is commonly used, which is what is available. People uh, take what is typically available to them. They don't have most suicides. It's not like there's a great deal of planning that you wake up and the world is just so black, you'd see no way out and you take what's available. And if a gun is available, you'll probably be dead. And if a gun's not available and it's just knives and uh, pills and stuff, there's an ex overwhelming chance that you'll be alive and that uh, you'll never die from a suicide. And I'll take a minute to note that for anyone watching this stream, if you or someone that you love is experiencing a mental health crisis, you can reach out via phone or text to 988 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That is the National Mental Health Crisis Hotline, and you can receive support uh, through that hotline. And again, that phone number is 988. So Sonali, I'll turn to you now. Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, my work focuses mostly on the impacts of gun violence exposure on children. And what we tend to talk about uh, in the public discourse is, you know, the number of people who are shot and killed every year with a firearm. And of course, that is extraordinarily devastating. Those numbers have to be uh, documented and measured so we can better understand how to reduce them. But children, um, because of their developmental stage and their um, just their how kids are, they are uniquely vulnerable to gun violence, both directly, but also the indirect experiences with gun violence. Uh, and so the work that I have been doing, and, and if we're, we're talking about reframe, reframing narratives here, is to really understand the 
full scope of what exposure to gun violence during childhood means for children. Uh, we can talk about certainly the physical harms, as I was saying, but also for children who witness gunfire, who hearing gunshots regularly, who survive shootings. And again, remember, these are experiences that children can and are having more than once. These aren't one off events, right? Gun violence is so pervasive. We now have that we now have children experiencing gun violence in multiple forms. We call these adverse childhood experiences. So there is, of course, the physical harm associated with firearm violence, but also, of course, the emotional trauma, short and long term, um, you know, the fear and anxiety it can instill, you know, of course, gun violence exposure during childhood completely disrupts a child's sense of safety and stability. So we need to understand what that looks like and how to support them and their families and their school communities in the aftermath of that kind of violence. Um, we know gun violence certainly disrupts their, their uh, development. Um, it can impact everything from their ability to form healthy relationships, regulate emotions, achieve, you know, developmental milestones, their academic performance, social interactions. I could, you know, just go on and on with what this, again, the science has shown, but also this is very intuitive. It makes a lot of sense, right? That gun violence exposure during childhood is really devastating. I think the other piece we don't consider, and I think many uh, survivors of gun violence have spoken to this far more eloquently than I ever could, but just the profound grief and loss that comes with gun violence and the ways in which, again, that's something that our children are being asked to carry with, with completely inadequate resources or support. Um, and then, you know, we heard so beautifully spoken earlier, Gabriella was talking about the normalization of violence, um, you know, that persistent exposure to gun violence we know can desensitize desensitize children to its effects, um, can even normalize um, the use of firearms as a means of resolving conflict. And the tragedy of all of this is also that children who are exposed to gun violence may also be at increased risk for then engaging in and perpetrating violence themselves down, down the line, right? So we're contributing to cycles of violence that go beyond even their generation. It's intergenerational, and we really need to do all we can to actually prevent it. And what we're doing right now in our schools and to some degree in our communities is we are we are just reacting to one shooting after another. We're attempting to react, right? So if we look at how our schools are set up, I talked about this a little earlier, we are hardening our school buildings. We are, you know, arming teachers. We are using metal detectors or engaging in any number of school safety strategies that are very reactive and have very little evidence-based guiding their effectiveness. What we need to be doing is actually investing in real prevention. I mean, when we think about the conversation, right, and I know we'll, we'll go into this probably in a moment, but yeah. when we think about solutions, we tend to talk about solutions in this very myopic manner when in fact, prevention, just like we think about for any other public health issue, prevention of gun violence spans the gamut. And we're not using all of the tools in our proverbial tool toolbox. So we need to be doing that. So that sets us up to move into solutions. And Joseph, I'll, I'll come back to you about violence interrupters. Tell us what they are and how they can be used well in schools. So violence interrupters are considered credible messengers from the community that often have shared the same shared and lived experiences as the people that they're working with in those communities. So sometimes violence interrupters could be someone who was previously injured, right? They could have been a, a perpetrator of violence, but they're coming back into those communities, hopefully as healed persons that have been able to deal with their own trauma and coming into those communities in order to disrupt the cycle of conflict. And so as we've seen in the cure violence model that violence is treated as a, as a disease, they're there to stop the transmission and the contagion of violence from one person to the next. And so I, I think it's critically important that we emphasize bringing violence interrupters into schools instead of, again, as I've been emphasizing through this conversation, the over-reliance on law enforcement, as Sonali mentioned, the over-reliance on hardening our schools and hardening our targets. And I'll just give you uh, a briefly, like an example of what I experienced in school. So during my dissertation, I conducted uh, my dissertation study on the social context of adolescent violence in Harlem. And I can, I can vividly remember that there were two kids who were getting into a fight after school, typical three o'clock fight, 
And the, the school security suggested moving the kids outside of the school onto the perimeter of the school so New York City Police Department could address that problem. They pushed the kids out onto 135th Street where New York City 32nd Precinct could address it. A hundred kids are outside following the fight. Police jump out. They mace the entire crowd. Regardless of whether you were a perpetrator in that conflict or not, everyone was subjected to that level of police violence, right? And I think if we were able to, that could have been diverted. For example, if we had violence interrupters who were able to stop the contagion of that violence from moving from the school into the community. And that's part of the bi-directional flow of community violence, violence that starts in the community, comes back into the school and goes back out into the community that violence interrupters are very effective in addressing. And I would particularly say that in the case of, now that we're seeing more cases are tied to social media. And we really don't want law enforcement involved in monitoring the social media of our kids. But I think using a public health approach where we're using violence interrupters to engage kids on what's happening in social media and how that spills into other forms of subgenres of music, such as drill music, we can be more effective in addressing um, and reducing public and reducing gun violence without having to rely, over rely on law enforcement. So since we're talking about schools, I'll stay with that for a minute. I'll come back to you, Sonali, just briefly. Take that billion dollars, right, <laughs> and move some portion of it to prevention instead. What is an investment you would want to see? So <clears throat> I'm going to say this is, um, again, just sort of in the spirit of what real public health is. There's no one specific solution. And I think that's really important to underscore that we need to think about everything from policy all the way down onto reshaping our the environments in which children live and play all the way to what is happening specifically in schools at a primary, secondary and tertiary level. So it's not one specific thing, it's a combination of investments. But I'll share some examples here. Um, you know, just to echo what Joe was saying, this emphasis on punitive um, strategies on criminalizing school spaces, we know that doesn't work. Zero tolerance policies, a whole slew of existing policies and practices in in schools right now. And again, just think about it. Our, our um, public school system here in the U.S. serves an estimated 51 million children. That's a lot of kids who are right now in schools where there are practices, again, with no evidence saying, yeah, this actually works. So we need to step back and say, well, what does? And so examples of what we can do to really reshape school environments. And this draws from an extensive body of literature on school violence prevention. Um, that really talks about how can we center a primary prevention approach to invest in a school's environment to ensure that kids feel safe, they feel secure, and they feel valued. So this could involve things like implementing programs and practices that cultivate a sense of belonging, uh, efforts to foster positive connections between children, their peers, and their teachers, and also encourage greater agency among kids. Uh, one review of school-based practices, I'll just say um, that I've, I've uh, cited in my own work has talked about um, really emphasizing the importance of positive, multiple positive school climate indicators, including positive student teacher relationships and orderly and structured classroom environment, uh, implementation and availability of just like school wide effort, extracurricular student organizations, things that promote positive peer interactions, creating schools as spaces of belonging. Um, you know, really thinking about those connections there. You do all of that in conjunction with efforts like behavioral threat assessment, which actually are is a process that shows allows school to respond to the potential threat, but in a way that has that's driven by a level of compassion and act and actually addresses and tries to make sense of where, if a, if there is a kid. Uh, uh, posing a potential threat to a school community, understanding then what's going on at home in their community to meet that child and their family where they may be at. That coupled with uh, school nurses working with parents to so store those firearms safely and securely, doing away with, again, punitive policies that um, it, that remove children from schools. And remember, schools for many, many kids are one of the only places where they may have access to a whole lot of things that kids need, right? Food, um, 
a, a trust trusted adults um you know just a space to be that is that is um you know may provide like health care in some cases or mental yeah. health resources i mean i'm just thinking about all the roles in which all the ways in which schools play a role in supporting kids. If you just remove kids who are struggling or maybe dealing with something from that environment with no attention to what they need, you're just contributing to more uh, more challenges rather than actually, again, getting to the root cause. So, so now I, I don't want to, I'm sorry, but I don't want to get too far from something you said that I think <laughs> ties into where I, I, I'd like to hear from David, right? Because you talked about working with parents and about guns in the home. And David, that comes back to what we heard from you earlier. And I want to pick that piece up there and ask you about solutions about firearms at home. You raised the warning there. So what about solutions in that space? And right. Sonali, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah so, so I'll talk about two things. One is the fact that now all suicide experts understand the risk about having guns in the home. And so the Veterans Administration is trying to do things. The Army is trying to do things because study after study indicates that having a gun around when you're at, at high risk is a really serious problem. And this wasn't true 25 years ago. People just focused on the suicide experts, just focused on mental health. But what I want to talk about mostly is working with the gun community, that we and others have been trying to figure out ways to work with the gun community to get the message out about the relationship between guns and suicide. Kathy Barber in our group, I'll give you one good example. Um, she got herself invited to a concealed carry trainers um, uh, uh, group uh, in Utah, which is this incredibly red state. And she said to these concealed carry trainers, you're doing a very good job re trying to reduce gun accidents, but how many of you are talking at all about suicide? And the answer is basically zero. And she said, did you know that in Utah, for every accidental gun death, there are 85 gun suicides? And they said, is that true? That can't be right. And she said, raise your hand if you know someone who died accidentally from a firearm. And a few hands go up. Raise your hand if you know someone who died in a gun suicide. And every hand goes up because they are all gunners and they are these old guys and they are at the highest risk for suicide. She said, can we work together to create maybe a module about this issue? And they said, all right, let's see what happens. And they worked together and they created this module and they love it. Uh, it's modeled after friends don't let friends drive drunk. Uh, your friend is going through a bad patch. He's getting divorced. He's talking crazy. He's drinking. It should be your responsibility and everyone should know it's your responsibility to, and these are their words, quote, babysit his gun for a while until things get better. Uh, maybe he gets a new girlfriend and everything is much calmer uh, and then he can get his gun back. And this is, they love this because the government's not involved. They're calling this the 11th commandment of gun safety. Uh, they were saying, we have to get all the um, uh, instructors to understand this and work on it and include this. Um, and they said, you know, it's hard to, to get everyone to do this. There are new trainers all the time. We know the people in the legislature in Utah will just make it mandatory. So now man in, in Utah, this incredible red state, which is the gun training capital in the United States, is one of the very few states to make it mandatory. If you teach about uh, concealed carry laws, concealed carry, you have to have a module about suicide and how to help prevent suicide because everybody can play a role um, in preventing suicide and one of the big ways is when you're at high risk is to make sure there's nothing that's really highly lethal around uh, mm -hmm. that, 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 that's why you have suicide watches in prisons because there is this one specific time where you're at high risk you want to make sure that uh, something very lethal is not readily available Thank you, David. Before we get to audience questions, Gabriella, I want to come to you and we'll we'll look at the intersection. And this is a place that you're working in uh, of hate and hate crimes and gun violence. You've received uh, some funding uh, on this. Tell us what you're working on in that space. Yeah, so we're incredibly grateful for the Every Town Community Safety Fund, and it's it's actually a first in our in our GVP specific funding, and that's crazy because we've been we've been unified as an organization for almost eight years. So it's now as a first, even though we were started due to the Pulse tragedy, that we're now receiving uh, gun violence prevention specific funding. And and I want to speak to uh, something that David and Joseph mentioned is right. Even before these terms were understood, like to us, 
uh, community violence intervention and gun violence prevention weren't terms that we used. All we knew that we, is that we were hurting and we were just trying to figure out how to navigate these spaces. Um, so it's through the support of every town and others that we are now able to not only expand the current efforts that we have, but be able to facilitate new programming. So we're in the midst of actually creating a, a queer self-defense class for those that don't know, I'm in Central Florida, so there's a lot of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric that's currently going on. So a lot of our community members have either gone back into hiding or left um, due to this increase in, in hate-based violence that we see on a daily. Um, so it's really like giving people the tools to not only protect themselves, but to be able to protect others in a dangerous situation. So not only are we doing dis de-escalation tactics, but we're also doing stop the bleed, um, we're talking to gun owners, right? Because um, there's also this conversation that because this happened in Central Florida, that now nobody wants to to own a gun. But what ended up happening right after the Pulse tragedy is we had an increase of gun owners, right? But no one was having a conversation of what gun safety looked like. So it's really taking it back to the community and figuring out uh, what works for us. Um, so queer self-defense class is one of them. Uh, listening sessions, getting back in touch with our youth, our teachers, our caregivers, and our veterans um, that also may identify as LGBTQ and where they're currently sitting at in these spaces so that we could then um, create a model where we have these these implementers or as Joseph mentioned, these, uh, what was it, in interveners? I can't Violence remember what, interrupters. what you mentioned. Violence interrupters that could then go out into their spaces and disseminate this information. Um, we're also using art. That's one of the biggest things that we used in the beginning. We started a program called uh, Relax, It's Just Art. And literally, we just came together and we had a facilitator uh, that was an artist that helped us do drawings. And then after we built trust in that space, after about four or five months, we were having targeted conversations on these specific issues and people were engaging. And through those conversations, we're able to come up with better uh solutions. And I think it's also recognizing and honoring our indigenous roots and, and healing practice that sometimes have been either misunderstood or demonized in certain spaces. So what we've started doing also is creating ofrendas or altars, right, to, to memorize our, or memorialize our ancestors and those that we've lost. And it also gives an opportunity for people to engage. People are able to add a photo or food, or leave a note, and that's really had an impactful, um, it's been an impactful experience for, for a lot of folks. We recently were at a conference, and mm -hmm. we had people from the hotel engaged in the altar, right? So, so we're talking about a community of individuals, even outside of those that sit uh, at the intersection of LGBTQ and Latinx, and for us, it's really important that visibility is there, too, so that we can mitigate those differences. So I'll try to get at least one audience question in. There might be time for two. Joseph, this one clearly goes to you. This is from Scott. Is there evidence that the proliferation of community and hospital-based violence intervention programs will work? If so, will they work in all settings? So the jury is still out. There are there are studies that have shown significant reductions in, um, in shootings in neighborhoods where CBI programs are much more well-established. So there are been studies conducted in Baltimore as well as in the South Bronx and East New York that have shown significant reductions in shootings in those neighborhoods when a CBI program was more well established in those communities. So I'm saying anywhere between three and five years where violence interrupters are able to build that trust with the community and able to build those levels of rapport. We've also seen the same with hospital violence intervention programs and the one RCT I'm thinking about is uh, conducted by and led by my mentor, Carnell Cooper, which found that the re-injury rate between the experimental group was 5% versus 36% for the control group, right? So, but there are also, there are not enough studies that have been done. And I think one of the things that we are missing in this conversation, we have not discussed that for almost 25 years, there was really no gun violence research funding. We would probably be so far ahead with the answers to the questions you're asking right now if we had that funding. And so um, we're we're in the very nascent stages of 
collecting more data and we have a more robust funding infrastructure to conduct many of these studies. But there, uh, if I could slide in just two things that I think we we kind of skipped over. One, it, the easy accessibility to guns by young people. There was a time when you would have young people, there could be five young people on the corner and one person would have a gun and they would all share it. Now we have young people where all five have a gun, right? Because we have so many guns and proliferation. And many young people are carrying guns, not because they have malicious intent, but the, out of fear. There was a recent study done by the Center for um, uh, Justice Innovations, which found in New York City, many kids are just carrying guns because they, they, they're they in fear. There's a lot of dis de-policing happening in communities where kids feel like law enforcement, they're not act actively engaging and catching people who are engaged in gun violence. And kids are just uh, fearful uh, and distrustful of peers in their community. And it's not because they are have any malicious intent to use a gun, but because they're carrying guns out of fear. And the last thing I would say is, um, in terms of education, and Sonali brought this up, I think the upstream issue we need to really focus is on in schools is truancy and absenteeism. Because what we see that they lead to the highest risk for young people to engage in gun violence when they're not attending school. Thank you for uh, sort of pulling out the things that we hadn't yet touched on. That's the perfect segue into kind of our closing uh, statements. We've got four minutes left in this time. That gives me a minute for each of you to tell us one thing that makes you hopeful about the potential to reduce gun violence. Just, you know, a couple sentences each, Sonali. Um, well, so I'm uh, currently the inaugural president of the newly launched Research Society for the Prevention of Firearm-Related Harms, which is um, the first professional society uh, here in the U.S. dedicated to supporting researchers across career like career stages uh, and who are dedicated to the study and science and pursuing the scientific solutions to this issue on all issues, school shootings, firearm suicide, community violence, and everything in between. And um, I have the privilege of getting to work with colleagues here and 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 see how much work is dedicated day in and day out by so many, like hundreds of individuals, a result of the funding um, that Joe Joe just mentioned, um, that are working on this every day to, you know, push good solutions forward and at the not just at the policy level, but in lots of other ways as, as well. So that gives me a lot of hope um, because there's a lot of things we know do work and we just need to scale the solutions that do and, and continue to invest in the science so we can keep uh, developing new ideas for what is um, a devastating tragedy. Thank you. Gabriella. Um, I'd say that I'm encouraged by the growing recognition of gun violence as a, a public health crisis that really requires a comprehensive and intersectional approach. Just me being able to be on on, on this conversation in this panel, I, I wouldn't have thought that it was possible maybe six or seven years ago, and that speaks volumes. Um, to us being able to make that connection from academia and the implementers doing the work. Um, and then what inspires me also is witnessing my community refusing to accept status quo and really demanding action. Um, and knowing that everyone has a part in what that looks like, right? Whether it's at the front of the protest or being on conversations like these. Joseph. I'm inspired by the the level of investment and, and intention that's being paid now to CVI programs. I, I can recall working with um, uh, HVIP in, in Baltimore and the director, Dr. Kona Cooper, struggling to keep the doors open because there just wasn't enough funding out there to support CVI. And right now we're at the point where there's new legislation to break the cycle of violence act, which is calling for a $5 billion investment in CVI. I mean, we're talking about unprecedented numbers in the investment in CVI. And the last thing I would say is, you know, when I, or last two things, when I started um, this work, there were less than, I believe, 20 HVIPs around the country. There are now 63 under the hobby. Um, and then the last piece is, you know, I happened, I'm co-chairing the Black and Brown Gun Violence Researchers Collective because we have, as Black and Brown researchers have been marginalized in the gun violence research space. And uh, our goal is to uplift the research being done by gun violence researchers who are actually come from many of these communities that we're discussing and are more proximate to the problem. 
and also to encourage and develop the next pipeline of gun violence researchers. And so we recently were awarded $3 million from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We have significant funding from other uh, philanthropic initiatives. And I'm just proud to see that there's more of an investment as well in the gun violence in black and brown researchers and changing the narrative in gun violence being told and, and investigated by researchers who look like the very same people who are disproportionately impacted by gun violence. Thank you, and David? And so I'll just have an anecdote about Joseph's uh, talking about gun researchers. So we had a meeting of all the known gun researchers about 15 years ago, and there were 20 of us. Uh, and last meeting uh, in Chicago, there were 750 uh, attending. So suddenly we're going to get we're getting so much more research, so much better research. Uh, and I guess my I'm always ho hopeful because I'm in public health, and there've been so many great success stories in public health, from motor vehicle safety to cigarette reductions uh, in smoking. And here, what we're seeing for the first time is such a big increase in the number of institutions and groups who are trying to do something from hotels to hospitals to barbers to you name it. And so I think there really is for the first time uh, energy and, and a real reason to be um, optimistic. Thank you everyone for joining us and I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon.